lots of different uh, and really good talks in the password track. I have to say that uh, this is the tenth time I do the passwords track or passwords con. This is my fourth year doing it in Las Vegas. It's the third year I do it in cooperation with B-Sites. And the next passwords con is going to be at the University of Bochum in Germany in December for two and a half days. And then it's a complete conference, so there's absolutely nothing else but password-related talks for two and a half days. And there's a really good uh, brewery just next to the university as well, where we are going for an engineering excursion in the evening, as we say. So uh, I'm not going to you know, uh, uh, use too much time up here. Uh, our first speaker is Jim Fenton. For those of you who have heard him before, uh, he's a really good speaker. Uh, I uh, really... I like the stuff that he's bringing to us. And today, uh, a very interesting talk toward uh, better uh, password requirements. So, uh, Jim, I will just uh, hand it over to you, and we'll get uh, started. Thank you. I think we're a couple minutes early, but that's all right. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll Hold on with you as well. <coughs> I'll start a little bit slowly. I'm Jim Fenton. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, we've talked in, in, in PasswordsCon and in a lot of other uh, venues about um, a lot of the th ridiculous things that we're, we're putting people through in uh, creating passwords, you know, you know composition rules, um, expiration, as, as Laurie Craner just spoke, for, for those of you that were in the keynotes. And... Um, it isn't very often that we have an opportunity to create um, uh, a set of password requirements or, or to kind of go through and, and rethink based on the research that's, that's happened and so forth about what password requirements really should be. And so uh, this talk is an attempt to describe an effort that's going on to do that, uh, the, going on at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST. Um, but uh, let, let me start with a, with a little bit of a disclaimer. We always have to start with a little bit of legalese or something like that. Uh, I'm a consultant for NIST uh, working on the revision of uh, SP Special Publication 800-63. Um, I, I don't speak for NIST. I'm not a NIST employee. So please bear that in mind even when I use the, uh, the pronoun we. Uh, I you know, really, really kind of feel like uh, a member of the team, and, and uh, uh, I have a, have a tendency to, to refer to NIST as a we, even though I'm not really a NIST person. Um, but uh, uh, bear that in mind. And, and then the other thing is that um, what I'm discussing is a, what we call a preview draft, and I'll get into what that means some more. Everything is very fluid at this point. Um, there are some, obviously, there's, there's been a starting point. There's been uh, a lot of uh, internal thought and discussion about what that starting point should be that's reflected in the, uh, in the preview draft that's, uh, that's uh, up and posted right now. Uh, but these things uh, can and will change, and sometimes they can and will change on a daily basis. So let me give you a little bit of context about um, where it is that we're talking about uh, uh, creating a, a new set of requirements. Uh, special Publication 800-63, which in the past has been called Electronic Authentication Guideline for, for various reasons, we're calling it Digital Authentication Guideline now, is a response to another document that was created in 2004 by the Office of Management and Budget in the White House. And uh, th that document, which is called MO404, is uh, it, it defines uh, a set of four levels of assurance that um, uh, and, and how to decide what level of assurance a particular government application is based on uh, well, what, the, uh, uh, what the risks are um, and you know, whether you know, maybe there's a, a threat of, of life or whether somebody's privacy might be breached or any number of other things. And so it, it provides a basis for, for categorizing federal applications into these four different levels of assurance. And then 
800-63 was created in order to respond to that and say, okay, here are the things that you need to do with identity proofing, with authentication, and with assertions in order to uh, respond to each of those four categories of, of applications. Uh, the the, the um, publication, as, I, as I've been saying, is primarily oriented at federal government agencies, although a lot of other people have uh, adopted it for other applications as well. <clears throat> There's a major rethinking and rewrite of 800-63 that's going on. And a lot of that has to do with an executive order that came out about a year and a half ago, which um, mandates the use of what they call an effective identity proofing process and multiple factors of, of authentication for a lot more applications. In particular, anything that citizens, consumers might log into and obtain personal information. So thinking of Social Security, IRS, Veterans Administration, those sorts of things that people log into that they might obtain personal information about themselves from are going to require two-factor authentication. Um, we've, here's, here's the first use of we. <laughs> NIST has um, broken this into four documents. There's a, sort of a top-level document, which is 800-63-3, 3 being the revision number. And then there are th now three sub-documents that are new. 63A, which deals with identity proofing, uh, which is the, the process of associating uh, a particular real-world person with an online account. How do you make sure that this person corresponds with that account? Uh, 63B, which deals with the authentication process itself, and that's where I'm going to be focusing most of this talk. And then 63C, that deals with assertions that would be used in a federated uh, uh, identity system where the verifier of the identity is not the same as the party that you're actually logging into. <clears throat> now, one of the things that this update has is a few guiding principles, and, and these aren't written in stone anywhere, these are just some that I jotted down, but these are characteristics that I think have been informing the, the process of, of this revision. We really want to do something better in terms of user experience. Uh, we've, you know, talked in the past at, at PasswordsCon about all of the things that um, users might be required to do, and they always find a way to cheat. And so if you make it too difficult for users, they're going to find a way around it and, and uh, not, not achieve the, the level of security that you want anyway. We want to have realistic security expectations. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, two-factor authentication is going to be required for more things. So a password as a single factor we, we're recognizing has a useful but not a, uh, an ultimate level of security. We're, we're not trying to lean on the password too hard. So we, we therefore don't want to put users through a difficult process in order to try and achieve something that we're not achieving anyway. We want to try and put more burden on, on relying parties, websites, verifiers, uh, as they're referred to, to do the right thing in terms of uh, the way they store credentials, the way, you know, the uh, kinds of credentials that they accept, uh, rather than to put more burden on the user. Um, and we also don't want to ask, and this kind of repeats what, what it said earlier, we, we don't want to ask users to do things that are really just not helping. So some of you may not have worked in the standards world before, but we have different levels, different terms that we use that are uh, uh, levels of requirement. So the highest level in, and, and I'm referring to now the, the NIST usage of these terms, and I'll kind of compare them with, with IETF that I'm also familiar with. Um, the highest level is shall, which means that it's an absolute requirement. IETF tends to use the term must instead. They're more or less equivalent. 
there's should, which in the uh, NIST formulation is, is as it describes there. Uh, IETFs is maybe a little bit stronger. It's that uh, there, there may be good reasons to ignore this, but you should really understand the implications and, in other words, have a good reason if you're not doing a should. NIST is maybe a little bit, not, not quite that strong of a statement. May, of course, just means it's something that's permissible and um, although IETF actually puts in some being concerned with interoperability a lot, IETF also puts something in there that if something is a may, that you also have to consider the uh, interoperability uh, consequences of that. So this being passwords con, I'm going to focus on what the document calls memorized secrets, which we commonly call passwords, but also passphrases and pins. I tend to use memorized secrets in order to be inclusive of all of those things unless I mean a particular one of them, like particularly we, we uh, distinguish pins in some cases from, uh, from others. So here's a quick summary of some of the things that are, that are uh, changed different in the, in the new draft, um, as it stands right now, of course. <clears throat> uh, memorized secrets. Uh, need to be at least eight characters in length and uh, that uh, the relying party should accept long memorized secrets of up to 64 characters and I'll talk about the rationale for that in a minute. Uh, we'll, you, we're using a dictionary in order to disallow common passwords um, and, and we want to be very liberal with the character set and what people are allowed to create their passwords from. We don't want to impose a lot of um, mental burden on trying to say, well, gee, no, that, that particular character I'm not allowed to use here. Uh, we're getting, we're discouraging the use of composition rules, hints for passwords. Um, Knowledge-based authentication is gone and um, routine password expiration is also uh, discouraged. So let me go into a little bit more detail about those. So in terms of the minimum length, um, we've, th there are really two different requirements that you could try to meet for minimum length. One is to defend against online attacks, and the second is to defend against offline attacks as well. Online attacks, you have the advantage that you can throttle, limit the number of guesses or limit the rate at which guesses of the password come in. So it's, a, it's an easier requirement to meet. Offline attacks, of course, you're, you're dealing with uh, potentially the, the compromise of the, uh, uh, of the credentials. And you're expecting that people are going to create something that's, that's really very difficult to, uh, to brute force. It's extremely hard to do that, the, the, and we've talked about this a lot in, in past password, passwords cons. And so we're really focusing on defending on, against the online attacks here. We've had a few comments saying, gosh, that's an awfully weak requirement, only eight characters, shouldn't it be more than that? And you know, there's maybe some discussion about whether it should be 10 instead of eight or something like that. It, Making it dramatically more simply drives up the um, uh, drives up the the, uh, the mental burden uh, for for people who are trying to use these systems, um, and we don't think that we're going to get to the point of being able to adequately defend uh, using length against offline attacks in any case. Um, the other thing that we're doing here, and, and this is kind of a general comment about the, about the specification, is to be trying, uh, trying to be consistent about the uh, uh, requirements at different uh, security levels. So the, at different security levels, uh, what we call authenticator assurance levels, AALs, the uh, requirements for a memorized secret are all the same. As you go to a higher level of security though, 
you go from AAL1 to AAL2, it becomes a two-factor authentication, and an AAL2 to AAL3 requires uh, a hardware factor as well, it requires that one of the factors be hardware. So uh, we're, we're trying to be consistent about that, and the, the, the old limitation of six characters at, at LOA1 was thought to be uh, a little bit too weak. So maximum length. The specification didn't talk about maximums at all uh, before. And we've seen all sorts of situations where you know, you're required to have at least eight characters and or at least six characters and a fairly narrow range of length. <clears throat> there isn't any reason in terms of storage or anything else why the length can't be fairly liberal. We want people to generate something that is memorable to them, and we want to constrain that as little as possible. So the, the, the specification says that the, the, the verifiers shall accept memorized secrets up to 64 characters in length. They can do longer than that if they want. Uh, and 64 characters is a, you know, kind of fits on a, fits on a lot of screens. It's not a, an overly overly long thing. Uh, question about that one. Uh, do you have any research done to say that it fits on many screens? Uh, Pear was asking if we have any research that it fits on many screens. Uh, you know, a survey or something? Or? No, we haven't. Uh, the, the, there, there hasn't been any, any particular investigation that was, you know, a little bit of a kind of let's, let's, let's put in a number and, and, and see what people say about it. So that's if, if people feel that, that, that that's inappropriately large, I, I want it. it uh, anybody into design or usability studies here? There's a job for you. <laughs> <laughs> the standard terminal is 80 characters wide, right? Yeah, I pointed out that the standard terminal is 80 characters wide, and, and, and I think you know, that's somewhat, somewhat the rationale, although it's a kind of an old fashioned rationale. We're not displaying passwords anywhere. Um, it, it mentioned that we're not displaying passwords anyway, but stand by. <laughs> I'm sorry. Portable devices aren't 80 characters. Port it's true. Portable devices are not 80 are, are not 80 characters. So you know there 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 may be some question some question about about this on on mobile devices. But the point is, let's not make it an eight character minimum and a 10 character maximum or something silly like that. Microsoft is 15. <laughs> I, I won't comment on Microsoft being 15. <laughs> but, but the point is, when you're storing the password, you're going to store the hashed value anyway. It's a constant length. So it is really not a burden to try and uh, accept a somewhat longer password than uh, it is to uh, um, just accept a 10 or 15 character password. Um, now, there, there ha somebody has pointed out that if we were to allow like multi-thousand character memorized secrets here, there might be some potential of a DOS attack against the verifier through the uh, uh, multiple rounds of, of hashing that you're doing. And, and you know, so fair enough on that. Maybe you don't want to go too crazy and allow people to use war and peace as their memorized secret. But um, you know, a, a, a length of you know on on this order is not should not be burdensome for the verifier. <clears throat> now we were talking about usability. I, I, I think Pear was asking if if there were usability people in the audience here. We have some some really good usability people. Um, there's that we again. NIST has some, has some really good usability people that they have assigned to, to this project. And uh, one of the things that was kind of surprising to me was the, the comment that they made about space characters. Um, they were concerned that you know, people would either forget to, to put in spaces when they're typing their password, not remember whether or not they'd put spaces in when they, when they created it, or maybe there would be things like they'd type two spaces and it would be kind of an invisible failure. So the thought here is that 
we, we definitely want users to be able to type spaces in their memorized secrets. Um, it, it's a natural thing to do. <clears throat> but uh, they don't really add that much extra entropy or randomness, um, whether they're there or not. So we, we allow for the possibility of canonicalizing them out, essentially stripping the space characters and then hash and store that value. And uh, you know, it, it provides, yes, it provides a little bit of, of wiggle room when, when uh, uh, if an attacker were to uh, get a hold of the password and, and all of that. But really, if they, if they had enough information to get the memorized secret anyway, it, it really wouldn't uh, add that much extra difficulty for an attacker to figure out where the spaces ought to be. Okay, character set. <clears throat> Uh, the, the, the previous version of the specification said that the alphabet had to be of 90 or more characters. And uh, this was largely from the standpoint of trying to estimate the uh, uh, possible entropy. And, and that, was a, a, that, that whole process was a little bit fraught. Um, the, the, the new specification is saying that the verifier shall accept all printable ASCII characters. Now, we see all sorts of exceptions to that now, where they you know, won't accept double quotes or won't accept you know, certain other characters. Uh, and you look at some of these requirements and you say, oh gosh, it looks like they're trying to predict against SQL injection attacks or, or something of that sort. That shouldn't be a problem. Before it goes anywhere near a database, the memorized secret needs to be hashed. And so the hash isn't going to contain those values, so why do we need to constrain people from using all of these things? We want to make it as easy for the user as possible. We're not, we're not trying to, to turn this into a contest here. We're also saying that it should accept Unicode characters. And yeah, some people like to put emoji characters in their passwords, and that's, that's fine, I guess. But I think it's also very important from the standpoint of uh, international users, users, uh, you know, even for the, uh, for the federal government, there's an awful lot of uh, consumers that uh, English is not their first language and something memorable might not be expressed in the English character set. <clears throat> so we're trying to get away from uh, all of these uh, usability problems and hopefully this will, this will help. <clears throat> Hints and prompts. We see sites that, in fact, I just ran into this when I was setting up Windows 10 the other day, where it says, you know, you need to provide a password hint. And it, we really think that it's training people not to uh, treat this seriously. Uh, you get password hints that are of the form, my password is blah. And um, you know, obviously, that's that's not that's not helpful. So, the, and and I've even seen attempts to uh, try and you know, make sure that the password hint doesn't contain the password. And you know, it gets to be kind of a kind of a um, uh, uh, point counterpoint sort of thing. So, we're just saying, shall not. Permit the, provide, per, permit the user to store a hint and shall not prompt the user with particular types of information that should be used as their password. And we'll get to knowledge-based authentication in a minute. Just, just because that weakens everything. <clears throat> Throttling is a tricky business. Um, we want to throttle in order to protect against online attacks, but if you throttle too much, you're going to essentially uh, either make it hard for the user or create the possibility of a denial of service attack against a particular user. If somebody wants to you know, harass somebody, they could potentially make it so that they can't log into their account somewhere. Um, so we've not, the, the, the previous revision of, of 800-63 had some guidance in there about things that could be done in terms of um, 
using CAPTCHAs, uh, whitelists, and, and you know, various things that could be used to try and mitigate the possibility of an attacker coming along and, and, and trying to uh, uh, lock somebody out of their account. Those are largely unchanged. Um, and, but we've, we've still gotten some comments about things like, well, gee, you should, you should make the uh, uh, failure count uh, based on IP address or something like that. Well, the, the, the problem here is that uh, if, you do, if you do some of those things, you've got to remember what, what the capabilities are that the attackers have. Attackers typically, or quite a few of them, have access to lots of IP addresses. Maybe they have a, a botnet at their, at their disposal that they can use for proxying and so forth. So we don't want to weaken the whole throttling uh, business by making it possible for an attacker to uh, game the system, as it were, uh, especially when Using, using, the, using the IP address is probably still going to have the same impact on a user that doesn't legitimately remember their uh, uh, memorized secret. And by the way, we're using this throttling in some other places in the, in the specification as well. The, um, uh, some places, like when you have a one-time password, um, you know, from a, a key fob or, or something like that, and it might have a six-digit number, that's roughly 20 bits of entropy, I guess. <clears throat> and uh, in, in cases like that where the entropy of the, uh, uh, of the verifier, uh, of, I'm sorry, of the authenticator output, as it's called, is relatively small, throttling is also required there. We've all run into composition rules, and we've talked about them a lot at PasswordsCon in the past. Uh, of course, these are the rules that say you need to have different classes of character, uh, uppercase, lowercase digits. But there are a lot of other more complicated things that, that people are asked to do. You know, don't have consecutive, more than three consecutive characters that are the same. Or it, it gets to be a real mental exercise to try and, and come up with uh, a password or a memorized secret that satisfies all of these rules, and they're different uh, in different situations. You have to sit there and study them for a while sometimes. Um, and they don't do that much good, research has found. So the new, uh, the, the, the draft now says that the verifiers should not impose composition rules, and, but should instead uh, use a dictionary uh, a blacklist, if you will, of uh, disallowed uh, memorized secrets. It doesn't say a whole lot about how to create that dictionary. I think that's, that's something that uh, might be a little bit too, I, I'm not sure that we, ha that, that we have enough information about exactly how that ought to be done, and that might be done in different uh, ways in different situations but we'll, we'll talk a lot more about dictionaries here. But, I mean, the rationale, of course, is that, that, that uh, uh, composition rules are just really hard on users. <clears throat> Fair. Simple, simple one on, on, on that one is, I think it's kind of cool the thing that Facebook does, because they actually allow you to use the, the opposite case version of your password to log in. So if your password is capital P, and lowercase password, you are actually also allowed to log in with lowercase p and uppercase password. They do that. Okay. And that's, that's simply because when you have 1.4 billion users, quite a few people actually have caps lock turned on and they were not supposed to. So that's the thing that Facebook, I think they came with that like maybe two years ago or something, two or three years ago. Okay. Pa pair of notes that Facebook has uh, some. Uh, ability for users to enter passwords in the, in the opposite capitalization. Yep. I guess that's a, that would come less as a, as a composition rule, but maybe as another form of canonicalization. Yeah, I mean, you could say it's an improvement of the UX on, on the server provider side. So they just take into account that people may have pressed caps lock and uh, so they accept it. Yeah. In, so in, Facebook in, then stores your password in two different formats. Uh, in, in, no, it doesn't. They, don't? Uh, they just try again. If, yeah, if it fails, 
they just run through. Oh, again that's what that's the way to do it. Okay. Yep. Right. Sorry. Right. So if it fails, it just it, it just tries again. Um, Won't you end up in a situation if you have too many known secrets that the user will end up having to enter many times because the dictionary is so well known of positive known secrets? Uh, the question is, what, won't we have a, a situation where uh, there are too many known secrets and, and, and users have problems with that? Stay tuned. That's the next couple of slides. <laughs> Up and back. Some, I see a hand. The question is, if I want to deliberately use an insecure password, why can't I? Um, Part of, part of the issue here is that the user, in, in many of these cases, the user is not the only one that has a stake in the, in the uh, privacy, in, in, the, in the, the, the security of the account. In a, in a healthcare situation or something, uh, a, lot of, a lot of other sensitive uh, situations, if there's, if there's a breach, it's a significant burden on the party that you're logging into as well in order to disclose and mitigate that breach. So uh, there are... Uh, the reason I asked the question is that it's not clear to me that most users of companies is ever explained why the burden is on the user to comply. Uh, never, it, that at companies it's, it's never explained to users, uh, the the uh, why why they have this burden, uh, I agree. Um, there there needs to be some better training there. We're, we're doing our best to to you know make the make the burden on users uh, to to mitigate the burden on users, but we can't make it go away entirely. <clears throat> All right. So let's talk a little bit more about dictionaries. Um, I mean, one of the questions that, we, that, that you might ask about dictionaries is sort of how big should it be? If it's too small, if the dictionary has 10 entries in it, then there are an awful lot of frequently guessed passwords that are um, still allowed. If the password is enormous, then you're basically making it very hard for people to come up with something that isn't on the list. <clears throat> so th that, 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 that's one question. A second question, and, and I was talking with, uh, with uh, Lori Craner about this a little bit earlier, <coughs> what happens when we, when, we imp when we use just a dictionary like this? Will users do something um, predictable when they're told that, I'm sorry, that's not an acceptable password. So will they do something like put a one on the end, put an exclamation point on the end, just something very minimal in order to try and get around the, uh, uh, the, the dictionary? Uh, that's a, a, a subject for a little bit of research, and I, and I understand that's, that's going on. Um, and, it, and if we do have that possibility, of course, a dictionary becomes a great resource for somebody that um, wants to do some offline cracking is like, here's the starting point, now just apply the following however many transformations to the entries in this dictionary, you know, maybe change all of the uh, L's to ones or, or whatever, you could do the leet speak uh, sort of transformations, you know, you, you, know, you, you guys have, have all thought about uh, a lot more of these than I have, uh, but you don't want the dictionary to be necessarily something that is going to help the attacker um, attack memorized secrets, and that's a, that's a concern. So I decided to play around with dictionaries a little bit. Um, how, you know, how big of a dictionary is effective and, and, and what's in it? So um, uh, I, I started, Mark Burnett has curated a list of 10 million compromised uh, passwords, and um, that, I thought that was a, a good, you know, kind of publicly available starting point. So I took that list, limited it to the entries that are eight characters or more, and got about half a million entries and about uh, 3.2 million distinct passwords. And here's kind of what they look like. Um, 
And you know, this is a distribution that you that you kind of expect. Uh, this is, of course, log distribution vertically, but you can kind of see down the just kind of a sampling of the things. Of course, password is the number one password, but we've got some some interesting good ones. Mot de passe, which is uh, the the French one, and this you know, the welcome one two three, and then you get down here, and they get you know a little bit PC seven FDDMH. That's a little bit more obscure. So it, it kind of has the right form. Um, this was a, a pretty useful list. There are an awful lot of passwords that are of the form of a date, which is you know, maybe more than we expected there. But um, you know, you're probably not going to get any sort of a any sort of a, a, a list that's uh, absolutely pristine. One other thing you can do is you can do the the log log graph, which ideally for a Pareto distribution like this should be a straight line. It's got a few bumps, but it's got about the right kind of distribution. So kind of think that we're doing roughly the right thing. And so um, on this graph, if this is, if you, for example, more than three occurrences of a particular password in the list, there are about 100,000 entries. So you probably don't want to disallow every password that has ever been used in your corpus. Um, you just want to disallow the ones that are that are commonly used. So, the the, the point here is that we we start with a corpus of of uh, several million, um, and we get down to a fairly manageable number fairly quickly just by disallowing the the uh, the, the passwords that are there one, two, or three times. And that doesn't necessarily need to be the way that it's created, but it's just kind of an existence proof, I think, really. <clears throat> so it was pretty simple for me to build a, what seems like a reasonable dictionary. Of course, I don't have any real testing to, to indicate its effectiveness. Um, but we, we still have this problem. Our, you know, if, if bad password is on the list, will users try and change their password, try and use bad password one instead. And you know, that, would be a, that would be a serious shortcoming of this, of this whole thing. And hopefully we'll find out from, from some research about that fairly soon. Now, I talked earlier about trying to put a little bit more of the burden on the verifiers on the non-human side of this. And <clears throat> uh, the, the, the previous versions of uh, SP 800-63 you know, had some, had some guidance there. Um, it said, fortunately said, shall not store plain text, but of course that's not very much of a requirement. It could be just hashed once or, you know, not even salted, anything like that. And, and of course that was at LOA1, which we discussed earlier was a little bit, uh, a little bit weak. Um, at LOA2 and higher, it says that it may you may salt and uh, derive the key or, uh, or encrypt, which, again, it's a may. It's not a very strong requirement of the, of the specification. So this was something that needed, to be, that needed to be strengthened. And so the draft now says that the uh, uh, memorized secrets shall be hashed with a 32-bit random salt using an approved key derivation function. Of course, the, the, the requirement for using approved functions is kind of throughout the specification. Um, it, uh, you know, there are some popular things like bcrypt that are not currently approved functions, but if you're not a federal agency, you can you perhaps don't need to, to deal with the uh, uh, approved aspect of it as much. Um, we say that it should, uh, should be done uh, 10,000 iteration rounds. This is, of course, to drive up the, uh, the, the, the work function for attackers. And we also say that it should use a keyed hash, like HMAC, with a key stored separately. Because, and this is really important, if you, if you use a keyed hash and the key is not breached, then there is really no offline attack possible. And that's the best of all worlds. Now, you don't want to put all of your eggs in one basket or all of your eggs in one key not being breached. So actually, it might be a good idea to do both of those things. 
but uh, we really want to encourage or require verifiers to do a better job of, of, st of storing the, um, the values that they uh, use to, to verify memory secrets. And now we get to the point of talking about displaying secrets, and, and uh, this, this came up earlier. Um, this was some more input from the, uh, from the uh, user experience team at NIST, which basically said that, you know, in an awful lot of situations, people are trying to type, and we're, we're trying to encourage people to use longer memorized secrets, and they're trying to type memorized secrets in a situation that there isn't anybody else around. They're sitting in their office at home or something like that. Um, uh, why not give them the option? Why, you know, there, there are sites that, that, that do this now. Why not give users the option of checking a box and making, the, making the, uh, what they're entering visible? And, uh, you know, of course, you don't want to do that in all situations, you, you really do want to obscure it in situations when, when people are likely to be shoulder served. But this, this is something that I think will encourage people or make, make people more confident in creating uh, longer and therefore more secure memory secrets. Um, and it just kind of takes, takes, takes the burden off. Uh, expiration, uh, Lori Craner in her, in her keynote talked a lot about uh, the uh, uh, expiration of, of passwords. There was the, the specification before was silent about this. Um, it's now saying that verifiers should not, it's not an absolute requirement, but it's a should not uh, require uh, memorized secrets to be changed periodically or otherwise arbitrarily. Of course, if there's a breach or something like that, you should absolutely require users to change the passwords. But just doing it for the sake of doing it is thought to cause, if not negligible benefit, it, it, perhaps even more harm than good. Now, I'm going to broaden out a little bit. Um, and talk about a few other uh, types of authenticators besides passwords, because uh, there's a lot more to the specification. I've been talking about a, uh, a very narrow piece of it. Previous versions of the specification had a thing called pre-registered knowledge tokens. Uh, token and authenticator are synonymous. We're using authenticator now in order to avoid other conflicting uses of the word token, like in OAuth tokens and things like that. Um, that has been eliminated uh, in, in, the new, in the new specification. There is no longer a pre-registered knowledge token. And I think we all know why. It's because uh, the, they're, they're, much, they're, they're subject to reuse and, the, and they're not very strong in the first place. Um, so questions like uh, your, your first pet are no longer allowed. There's been a lot of talk in the last week or two about out-of-band authenticators, and I'll, I'll get to the, to the question of SMS in, in, a, in a minute here. Um, but the, um, uh, the, the point of, a, uh, of an out-of-band authenticator is that it should be uh, uniquely addressable and separate in some way. Of course, virtualization <laughs> makes the question of separate a little bit vaguer, but the communication channel that it communicates over should be separate from what you're authenticating on. Um, there are some new, some new possibilities here to where the response can actually pass over a, a protected channel. It can be kind of more of a, a one-way in the, in the opposite direction from you know, what, what you might think of, say, with SMS. Um, and uh, the Part of the idea here is since we're requiring that it be a uniquely addressable device, <clears throat> there's a requirement now that the device authenticate itself using approved cryptography in order to establish that it's, that it's a unique device and a particular device. Because this is out-of-band authenticators are something that you have, not 
something like a password. So we're trying to prove the possession of a particular thing. Uh, SMS, um, there have been some uh, pretty high profile breaches. Uh, I believe Lori Craner actually had one as well. Uh, and uh, uh, Ladar Levison, who's uh, known for the uh, LavaBit email service, and uh, DeRay McKesson uh, of uh, Black Lives Matter, all suffered breaches that were uh, contributed to by uh, uh, compromises in uh, SMS-based two-factor authentication. And who knows how many more there are that we, that we don't hear about. But the point here is that there's both kind of the, the physical security by, of the device and the, the, you know, whether or not the uh, you know, SS7 network could be compromised. I, I don't actually know of any, of any uh, SS7-based attacks on, on an SMS two-factor. But um, there are all, there's also a very substantial ecosystem around mobile phones where you know, every outlet that can sell you a phone basically is empowered to uh, you know, help get your current phone number assigned to that phone. And we're depending on the reliability of thousands and thousands of retail clerks in random stores all over the place in order to make sure that someone's telephone number isn't assigned to an attacker's telephone. Uh, that, I think, is the biggest uh, weakness in this whole system. It isn't, it isn't so much of a technical weakness as a social engineering weakness. And, and I think that's what's happened with a lot of the uh, uh, SMS attacks that, that, that we've heard about. Um, there are also, uh, there's also the possibility that, a, that, that a, a voice over IP phone number can be used. And of course, if, if you're using a, a VOIP phone number, it isn't proving the possession of a device at all. And that's why it's, it says, shall not be a VOIP number. That's, that's just, not, just not proving possession. There are a number of changes. I could probably give a whole hour-long talk about biometrics. Um, so I'll just kind of touch on it briefly. Uh, the, the requirements actually haven't changed that substantially uh, in terms of how they can be used. A lot of people were concerned about the fact that there were fairly limited uses for, for uh, acceptable uses for biometrics in the, in the previous versions of the specification. Um, uh, but they, they still need to be bound tightly to a specific device that's doing the authentication. You can't have the situation where you have, um, you know, maybe a, a retail store that you, you use your thumbprint at, at any uh, cash register or something like that. You need to really enroll the, the uh, uh, biometric uh, with, a, with a particular verifier. And um, therefore, Every time you're using a biometric, it sort of becomes a multi-factor authenticator because you're proving not only the biometric, but you're also proving the possession of the device. So that's kind of where biometrics are special. They're always multi-factor in the, in the accepted uses here. <clears throat> um, there are now performance metrics that are required for, for biometrics in terms of the false match rate and the false non-match rate. I won't go into the specifics, but they actually aren't as um, strong as, as I expected that they would be uh, based on apparently what's being achieved. And there's a hard limit now on consecutive failed attempts. Uh, very much like you know, if you're using biometrics, if you're using fingerprint on your iPhone, after a certain number of tries, they'll say, no, nah, enter your pen. <clears throat> uh, that's kind of, uh, kind of what's required here. And it has to do with what those performance metrics actually are that can be achieved. So you still need to have some sort of a backup for it, maybe a memorized secret to use if you, if you hit that hard limit of, uh, of 10 failures. One thing that has been uh, liberalized is that uh, verification can be performed centrally, providing you're still binding it to a particular device and, and meeting all of the other requirements. <clears throat> so. I'm going to talk briefly about how everybody can participate in this, in this process. 
Um, we've, um, we're doing something very different this time uh, from, the, from the normal uh, uh, special publication update process. The, uh, the, there's a preview draft that's available right now. You can look at uh, this URL. <coughs> And uh, if, you, if you can't remember it all, just remember pages.nist.gov, and it gives you a directory, and you'll see 800-63-3 at the top. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's, it's live off of GitHub. So as changes get, get uh, cranked in and so forth, uh, this, this document changes sometimes several times a day. Um, so you know, have a look at it. Please do. Uh, submit comments. There's some some guidelines on on, on how to on how to do that. Um, you submit the comments right now via uh, issues on GitHub. Some people have actually submitted pull requests, um, and you know you, you can do that if you want. But uh, uh, issues issues are fine. And <clears throat> the idea is uh, that we're doing a very open and a very continuous integration sort of revision of this document. And thus far, it's been working out very, very well. Um, the public preview period runs until the middle of September or so. And then after that, there will be the standard formal <coughs> comment period, because not everybody's comfortable with, with uh, this, this model with, with uh, GitHub and all of that. But uh, we're really hoping to get as many comments as early as possible uh, and uh, have, have that formal comment period perhaps be a little bit shorter than it might otherwise be. So that's about it. Uh, if there are any other questions, I'll try and handle those in the time remaining. Yes, sir. Hi, thanks. I appreciate how open you guys are being with this. Um, I have two short related concerns. Um, one is perfect is the enemy of good enough, so I worry that you might be raising the bar a little high in some cases. The reason that worries me is your answer might be, this, the, oh, this is just for federal agencies, and then that's not true anymore because SP 800-171's already hit us or is about to hit many of us. And so we're already now being told FIPS validated cryptography for confidentiality. This could be the next thing that becomes mandated upon the general industry. Um, so it's not just for federal agencies. And that's, that's fearful if the bar is raised too high. We're mindful of the fact that um, uh, SP 800-63 is, is, is used quite a bit outside of the, uh, uh, outside of the uh, uh, federal government. Um, at the same time, the, there are some you know, significant concerns with things like uh, storage of, of credentials and uh, uh, the places where two-factor authentication is required. Um, where things either just really do need to be improved or uh, there are actually mandates like in the executive order that came out uh, that saying that uh, you know, we need to do two-factor authentication in a lot more cases and so we really need to figure out how to do that more at scale. And, uh, but thank you. Yes. Uh, one simple question. Um, so it seems the majority of the spec is being guided from the perspective of the user and user experience. Um, will there or are there guidelines on foiling common malware strategies like keyloggers and other attempts to circumvent or capture that user data, such as if you're displaying the password and there is a screen capture tool on that device, what would you do? Uh, so that, that's a good question about a, a <clears throat> screen capture. Uh, I'm, I'm personally been thinking about the, the question of malware, or man in the browser, man in the middle attacks, quite a bit. Um, of, of course, yeah, there is, I guess there is a new, there is a new risk if, uh, of, uh, you know, d displaying the password if, if uh, a screen logger is there, but I don't see that as being any more likely or, or likely to be there at times when there isn't also a key logger. So I, I don't see that as being a significant new and additional weakness that that's introducing. Okay, last one before we do a short break. So I had a couple quick questions. So when you mentioned the out-of-band 
process with SMS. So I think what I heard from you is the basic reason that that is being cut off is because it cannot authenticate the the device. Is that correct? Uh, <clears throat> that that's right. Because be, uh, the the what out of band is trying to do is trying to establish possession of a particular thing. Okay. Um, and then um, real quick. The requirements for authenticating the out-of-band provider or even other non-human based devices, are there, are there, is there any call out in the section or in the specification about or the standard about that? So I'm thinking like app passwords and even you mentioned that the out-of-band provider has to authenticate. Are there special requirements for the authenticator? I think like right now we commonly see some uh, sort of like 64-bit uh, random keys that are generated for some of these type uh, authenticators or app, app passwords that are then left forever as far as, you know, like uh, API keys, et cetera, similar. Right. Um, there, really the requirement for out of band is that, that uh, the device, not, not so much the provider, but that the physical device be authenticated. And, and it needs to pass through a secure channel, so hopefully the provider is kind of irrelevant there. I mean, there are other, tor other sorts, there are lookup secret authenticators that I didn't really talk about, but you'll, you'll see them there in the, in the specification that probably correspond better to your example of, you know, like a 64-bit thing that might be, you know, printed and st you, you store in your strong box or something like that. Okay, that was the last one, so thank you, Jim. Thank you.